Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games, back with another cool pinball machine repair for you this evening. We are here in beautiful downtown, historic Rock Hill, South Carolina. Everybody said they love it when I say that. It's the truth, people. Beautiful, historic downtown Rock Hill, South Carolina. And we've been working on this Williams Lucky 7 pinball machine. Now this thing, when we got it, it was junk. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I've still got that video where I can splice that in here. I don't. I'm, I probably don't have the video anymore. Well, yeah, I do. I'll, I'll show you, but I'm not the only one. See, a lot of repair people, they understand what I'm saying. So I'll, let, let, take a listen to this guy for a second. In fact, Jacobson built tractors for a lot of companies besides Ford, including Minneapolis Moline and Oliver. This 120 has been part of Clifton and Taylor's collection for about a decade. I had that about 10 years. It was a piece of junk when I got it. I... A true repairman. A true repairman. So that's how this was. When we got it, it was pretty beat up. We're fixing this for a customer, our buddy Rodney. Uh, we've had this game before, one the same title at least, uh, and it's a fun game. Uh, but this one ain't doing nothing yet. All we've got are the general illumination lights working. So we did a video where we worked on the power supply, got it all, you know, the power supplying. <laughs> and then we did a video where we worked through the play field, cleaned it all up, got it pretty nice. And now we're going to work on this MPU. So this MPU has been hanging out in this particular head for a while now, and it is battery damaged. The batteries are still on the board even. So this is from the 70s. Battery damage. Right on the EEPROMs. Oh no, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to fix it. So if you like uh, battery damage repair videos, you've come to the right place. So I'm first thing I'm going to do is turn this thing off. I just have it on for pretties. I'm going to turn it off. We're going to pull that board out and go put it on the bench. And we'll get a little closer look at it and see how bad it is. Just looking at it, I think it's savable. So we're going to try our hardest to save it. Here we go. Okay, so this is a Williams System 3. See the dash 3 there? It's a Williams System 3. That's their earliest, earliest solid state games. I mean, we're talking the first one or two. It's literally that early. Um, so the way these work is this is the MPU board. There are, there are all of these pins here that connect to this connector. They literally go through the board. I'm not going to do it because they're filthy. But And then this driver board is basically the other half of the MPU. So uh, the CPU, I think it's a CPU. Let me see. Oh, it's one of those that they've scratched the stuff off of. I can see it a little bit. I can't even remember if the CPU is here or there. I believe that's the CPU. But the CPU talks with a PIA, which is either that one or that one. Uh, and then it talks to three more PIAs on this board. Okay, So on this driver board, one of these PIAs handles all the solenoids. That's all this. One of these PIAs, which stands for Peripheral Interface Adapter, handles all of the lights, which is all of this. And then the computer controlled lights. And then one of the PIAs, the peripheral interface adapters, they're all 6821s, uh, handles the switches, which is this area. Okay. So when the game boots, it actually talks to these PIAs and it expects to get some signals back. So the problem that you run into when you're test when you're uh, uh, troubleshooting these is you don't know if the problem is on the MPU or if the problem is on the driver board. Now on this particular driver board, I've got won't boot written on it, and that looks like my handwriting. I don't remember writing that on there, but it was probably a long time ago. It could have been 10 years ago. It's probably been quite a while. I don't even own any Williams uh, System 3 through System 7, which is basically, they're all very similar. I don't even own any Williams System 3 through System 7 games anymore. Uh, Rodney brought us this game that was missing the boards and stuff. I guess it's, you know, this MPU must have been in it. Um, but, uh, like this driver board, I don't even remember when the last time I would have been working on a driver board was. I have worked on some 
um, a whole bunch of these over the years, but um, I sold the last one that I actually owned um, a couple years ago. We we have a storage building with a bunch of games in it, and um, we probably still own 40 pinball machines, something like that. But we don't have any Williams System 3 through System 7. We brought them all in and fixed them. The, uh, we had a flash that was really rough, and we fixed it. So, um, um, just saying. Um, but I think we're going to try to put this driver board in it. So, how do you test the MPU board without the driver board? Well, there is a... If you're running the original program, like you're trying to run the pinball machine, yeah, you can't do that. It, it needs the driver board to boot up. However, there was a gentleman named Mr. Leon many years ago who created a, a test ROM that you put in this game uh, on the board, and then uh, basically it just tries to flash all of the PIAs and stuff. And so you can use that to test everything and tell if the MPU is any good. So that's what we're going to attempt to do. But before we do that, we're going to have to clean up all of this alkaline damage. So here's your... Here's our thumbnail. This this will be the thumbnail, I'm sure, of the video. Look at that. Mm, mm, mm. Pretty bad. So, if you've worked on a bunch of this stuff, or if you are a fan of videos where people repair stuff like this, you can probably tell by looking at it, this is not the worst I've ever seen. I've seen much worse, actually. This isn't even that bad, I don't think. So if you're the type where you've repaired this stuff, walk with me through it a little bit here. These are just traces. And they're thick traces. You know, back then, the traces were pretty thick. So if we have problems here, it will be at the... Uh, these are basically vias, I call them. Vias, vias. So this... This little solder spot here connects through to the other side of the board. You might run into some problems there, right? But the actual trace on the board, they're all so thick, that's not going to be a problem. So we're going to clean this up with sandpaper and go crazy on it. This chip here is just a logic chip, and you've got some uh, filter capacitors here. Just, uh, what do they call those? Bypass capacitors. Of course, they're nothing, okay? Now... The EEPROMs were going to replace all of them, although, I mean, if they were still fine, you could just clean up the legs and put them in. Obviously, the sockets need replaced, but uh, these are very small chips, so over time, they came up with a way to consolidate some of them, so you don't need as many. So we're probably going to do that, which will limit the number of sockets that we have to repopulate on the board. This one isn't that bad either. I mean, obviously, they need replaced, but it's not the end of the world, right? It's another one. You see the, yeah, I'm upside down, but you see the 77 dash, 70, the, 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 the 7750, 50th week of 1977. We're talking old, people. Okay. Here's another one. But not that bad. Here's, this one would have been unpopulated from the factory. You can see where the bypass capacitor that was there was either cut off or broke off. And then, you know, some random nonsense here and there. Once you get over to here, those chips are probably fine. It rears its ugly head again here on this socket, but... Just my experience in the past, that socket there you could probably clean up and leave. I'm not going to. I'll replace it. Now, here is the crystal for the board. You can see the heat damage on it. It's probably still fine. The reason that it's like that is because if you think about this being mounted in there, this is not the same board that was in the game. The one that was in the game is missing. Uh, they have this issue where they have these big old power resistors here for the lamps. And these things get hot, you know. So these look like they're all screwed up. They're not. They just look bad. That's just, it's typical for these older Williams games, they do that. So these were putting off a lot of heat, so you can see how it scorched this board, right? Well, on the board that was in there before, 
it was probably much worse. And you can see that is the source of that heat damage on the crystal there. But it's not the end of the world. It'll probably be just fine. Now these pins here, these male pins here, that's pretty bad. Um, there is a connector on this driver board, like I mentioned, the female part there. That needs to be a good connection because it's passing logic signals across that. So you can't really clean this up and make it work right. So we're going to have to replace all these. But that's okay. okay. So if we go over here, these sockets, actually, at least that one, is nowhere near as bad. Yeah, that socket's probably fine. And that one's probably fine. That one obviously is a problem. And here's the other side of the batteries. This area here, I think, is uh, an area that you can put jumpers in for certain things. We may have to do that when we uh, change the board to take uh, bigger EEPROMs. And I think this is the reset section. So, uh, yeah, we're looking pretty good, I think. All right, so what will really tell us the tell, though, is the back. How bad is the back? I haven't even looked at it yet. Uh-huh. As I thought. It's not bad at all. Of course, there's not much on the back, but... Like I said, if you've worked on alkaline damage, battery damage stuff before, you can probably, you would probably agree with me that this really isn't all that bad. It could have been much worse. So uh, that's what we're kind of starting with. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start depopulating some stuff. I'm gonna, I want to get this part of the board stripped down. Okay. So obviously we want to leave, lose the battery holder. I'm going to go ahead and take the pins out. I'm going to take these four sockets off, and probably that socket, um, and get this down to like just the bare board. Then I'm going to sand the crap out of it. Then I'm going to put some uh, vinegar on it, and then we're going to start putting it back together. So that's our plan. Okay. So let me start uh, desoldering things. If you if you have something like this where it's got uh, battery damage on it. If you're trying to get solder to stick while you take it apart, uh, what you probably need to do is take a wire brush and go to town on it. Now, I'm fortunate, like I said, this is from the 70s, so the, the traces are all big, you know. More modern stuff's going to have much more fine traces that you can tear up. It's hard to tear these traces up. You can go to town with a wire brush on it, and it will not mess up the traces. Um, but if you've got if you've got corrosion like this on a trace, solder is not going to stick to that. So if I'm trying to desolder something, it's not it's just not going to work on something like that. Now if I get on it with a wire brush and get that nice and shiny again, then then solder will stick to it. So that's what we, uh, that's how we're going to do it. Okay, so let me see what I can get off of here and we'll go from there. All right, so I popped a bunch of it off. What do you think? The, the two sockets up here uh, are Scanby sockets. S-C-A-N-B-E. Let me see if I can find the logo on it. Whoa, too close. We got too close, people. Uh, you can't really read it. Let me see if this one is readable. Oh, we might. It's upside down, but you'll get it. They're Scanby. These things are horrible. Horrible. You can tell it what that you can tell they're Scanby if they have this closed frame. But let me show you why they suck. Uh, the pins are still on this one. So look at this. Look how this is designed. It actually grabs the side of the leg. Look at that. They designed it where it grabs the thin part of the leg, not the wide part of the leg. Just, it's a double wipe socket. 
that grabs the thin side of the leg. Just crazy. I guess that was some kind of patent thing. Okay, so I got a bunch of the junk off, so now I'm going to try to uh, remove it with solder and get all this going. These two sockets here we're not going to use. We're going to use these three sockets for our ROMs. And of course those have to go back, and that has to go back. I'm serious, people. I'm serious. We're going nuts on it. Okay, folks, about two hours has went by. We're gonna talk about this a little bit, and I'm gonna brag a little bit. Now, most people don't like a braggart, so I'm not gonna go crazy with it, but this is the fun part of pinball repair. <laughs> I'm not trying to denigrate anybody else. I'm not trying to say anything bad about anybody else. Here's the situation, okay? You can buy a brand new board and put in that machine. I just spent two hours taking the stuff off, cleaning it up, getting rid of all of the damage, right? Took two hours. I still have to repopulate everything, then we got to test it. It's probably going to take another two hours to do all that. But this is like a pure repair, right? Anybody can put a brand new board in there. That's not, you, you know, if, if, if you are into pinball repair, even though it doesn't even make sense really to do this, this is what it's all about, right? Back in like, you know, the 90s, so this game came out in 77, probably late 80s, they were already having problems with battery damage and stuff. This is how people used to have to repair them. They didn't have brand new boards. So you, you fixed what you had. Now, to the, to the board's credit, like I said, there's big, thick traces. It cleans right up. Look, there's no damage, really, to the board. You just have to take the time and go through it and clean it up. So if you're not willing to do this, are you really a pinball repair guy? Or girl? <laughs> you know? I'm not, I'm not trying to brag, I'm just, I'm just saying it's coming across as bragging, but this is something to be proud of. This is you taking something that's old, it needs help, it's messed up. Hardly anybody's going to do it. Very few people are still doing this. People are buying brand new boards and put them in because we're to the point now where financially it makes a lot of sense to do that. New board's about 200 bucks. Like I said, it's going to take four or five hours just to get this one fixed and, and repaired and tested. If I was charging Rodney per hour, he probably would just rather have the new board, right? But this is fun. Like I said, this is the last Williams System 3 through 7. I may not ever do one of these again. It just depends on how many I get, you know. But I don't own any, and I've still got a box full of boards and stuff. But this is an opportunity for me to go through and fix it the right way. Get rid of all of the old trash, put what needs to be on there, old school, and get the thing running again, right? That's a that's a pure repair. That's something to be proud of. So that's what I'm bragging about. I, I don't think there's many people left who would take the time to do this. There was a time, not too long ago. Um I'll just I'll just say it and then people can get upset if they want, but I first started doing this prob it's probably been 15, 20 years ago now, right? There was a time when a game like Lucky 7, for instance, this game we're working on, you could buy the thing broke for 200 bucks all over the place. I mean, all of them were 200 bucks. Like, if it, all of the Lucky 7s were 200 bucks back in the day <laughs> if they were broke, right? And you would buy it, and it would have a messed up board. Well, at the, at the time... The game's not really worth that much. So at the time, you know, working, you, the thing would sell for like 450 So with a broken MPU, it, it didn't make sense to pay $250 for a brand new MPU for a game that was only going to be worth 450 bucks. So nobody did that. You know what people did? They did this. They fixed the damn thing. They actually repaired it, right? 
So I didn't invent any of this. I just read and, and figured out what everybody else had already done, you know? And I'm really all we're doing is just taking the old stuff off and putting new stuff on, right? Here in a bit, we'll use Leon's test ROM and that'll, that'll be cool. But this is the way that people used to repair them. This is, this is the cool way to do it, in my opinion, you know? Now, financially, it doesn't make sense all the time, but the, one of the reasons people did it like this was because this was the only thing that made financial sense back in the day. So you had people that they were living the dream of they wanted this pinball, they wanted a pinball machine in their house, so they found a cheap one. The board would be messed up. It'd be very common for this thing to, to have battery damage. And they'd fix it, and they'd take the time to fix it, and it was more of a hobby, right? And then when they got it all done, they would play it, and they'd enjoy it. And they didn't care what other people rated Lucky 7, if they rated it as one of the best games or not. And they didn't care how much the damn thing was worth. It was pure. It was a little more like a pure repair, a pure hobby, right? Well, I think we can all agree the pinball hobby has went all to hell. I mean, so the same game that would have been worth 450 before, now it's worth 1800 well, that prices everybody out that just wants to play it to have fun with it. And you you end up in this this crazy situation where games that that are not even the ones that people really want, even those are a fortune, you know? So brand new games are ten thousand dollars. Ten grand. Crazy. So I kinda like every once in a while at least, going back and Doing a pure repair the way it used to be done. That's cool, you know? One of the one of the best channels on YouTube, and all of you, I'm sure, watch them, but one of the best channels on YouTube, in my opinion, is Shango. Shango66. That guy is a pure repairman. He's he's a legit freaking repairman. That dude will get a TV out of the trash, damn things all beat up and everything, and he'll work on it for three days just to see the picture tube light up one more time. No money in it. He's not making any money doing it. He's a pure repairman. He just wants to fix the thing, right? He just wants to find the one cap that ain't quite right and, and put a new one in off of an old uh, trash board and get the thing to work one more time, right? That is so cool. Now, you can't do that with everything, and I'm not anti-capitalist. I like making money. There's nothing wrong with making money. I'm just saying part of being a repairman is like taking pride in what you're doing and and bringing something back to life that's cool you know so i, I love his channel because he really gets that he he's just doing it for the freaking love of the game and everybody's learning from it right so um that's why i enjoy stuff like this this is like you know i'm here a little late tonight working on this thing this is the fun part of pinball repair it's it's one of the reasons too that i don't even really like working on like more modern machines because it comes down to just gameplay stuff, you know, and everybody's very picky. They want it very particular, and um, you know, they want the this one shot and it should rebound just right. And I don't that kind of stuff. I'm not as into. I can see why people are because you know ultimately the things are supposed to be played. But when you're the repair guy, this is really cool because you you have the opportunity to take something that's completely destroyed. Fix it up, bring it back from the dead, and watch it watch it do its thing again. You know, we're turning back the years here. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's what I've always enjoyed about it, and I, I love this this early solid state stuff. It's so cool. I, I really like the EM stuff too, but uh, the EMs are just it's a lot of work. This is not quite as much work. Yeah, a couple hours in, in one board, but um, it's once you get it going, it's just it's a little easier to work through, but. This this stuff is the fun stuff to work on, in my opinion. The early the early Gottlieb stuff, the early William stuff, the early Stern stuff, the early Valley stuff is my favorite. The first generation of all of the solid state stuff is awesome. Um, I've got some uh, game plan stuff and some uh, Allied Leisure stuff too. Some of the more oddball ones. I'd love to get an, an Atari one. I had an Atari Airborne Avenger. 20 years ago, but at the time I didn't really know what I was doing, so I, I wasn't able to fix it, but I didn't really try to fix it either, but I'd love to have a, a an Atari um, pinball in that I could work through, but but anyway, that's just my little rant, right? I, every, if, if, if you're a repair guy or a repair girl and you're working on stuff, you should try to do something like this every once in a while, just for the fun of it. 
you'll enjoy it so much. Like there's, it's one thing to take a, to put a brand new board in the game and it starts working, but to take the original freaking board that you found in there falling apart, cleaning it all up, spending hours and hours and hours, putting every little thing back and then bam, that thing comes back to life. Nothing like it. That's the real hobby. That's my opinion, at least. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of... I've cleaned it up pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's it's pretty good. Uh, I'm going to take, especially in the areas where it still looks oxidized, you know, over here and stuff, I'm going to take some vinegar and a toothbrush and brush the vinegar on it. I'm going to let it sit for just a little while, and then I'm going to rinse the vinegar off. And then I'm going to let it sit all night and dry out. So why are we doing that? It's because batteries have alkaline in them which is a base and so we're going to put vinegar on it which is a acid which is going to try to neutralize it a little bit it's i'm not a chemist um but it it helps right and again i didn't invent any of this this is all old school stuff look at these freaking batteries they're duracells but they say mallory on them how old is that how old is a mallory duracell battery Look at that. P.R. Mallory and Company. Terrytown, New York, I guess it says. Is it, wait, am I reading that right? Terrytown, New York. And then it says, those wonderful letters you don't see too much anymore. Made in the USA. So how old is that battery? So it says alkaline. So it's Alkaline damage, not acid damage. I'm gonna try to look that up and see when Mallory made uh, brand or when Duracell made Mallory branded batteries. They stopped putting Mallory on the Duracell batteries in 1980. Those are the original freaking batteries. Holy crap! Awesome. <laughs> awesome. That's what I'm talking about. Let me fix some stuff that's really broke. This is the original freaking battery. Wow. That's amazing. So Mallory um, invented Duracell, and they changed their name to Duracell in 1978. The last ones that said Mallory were made in 1980, they said. This game, 1977-1978. I guess it would have been early 78. Amazing. Okay, so that's that. All right, so this is what we've got so far. I put new pins on. Brand new. Here's the part numbers for those, by the way, if you want some. These are getting harder to find, the, the long ones. So they make short ones, but the ones that are more extended are the ones that are actually meant to go through a board connector like that, right? But you can still get them. Um, replace this socket and put the chip back in. This has something to do with the clock signal, I believe. We're abandoning these two sockets. I filled the holes back in with a little bit of solder just for the heck of it. And then I put three new sockets in here. Remember, this one didn't even have a socket, okay? I put two sockets here. These are the 6810 RAMs. And this is the 5101 RAM. I'll put a new socket there, but those are the three original chips that cleaned up. This is also the original chip cleaned up. Um, so what I've actually put on the board is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sockets. Uh, 50 cents a piece, so three, three or four dollars worth of stuff so far. I did put new uh, bypass caps. These are 103s, .01 uh, microfarad capacitors. Um, I didn't put the two here. So the next thing we're going to do is, we're going to talk about ROMs here in a minute, but the next thing we're going to do is there is a chip that goes here that I'm not so sure we need. I think that has to do with uh, the chip selection, and I think it may only be used by these two sockets. So we're going to look in the schematics and see if it's all right to just leave that chip off or if we need it. We have to modify this chip up here to, to make it use this socket instead of these two sockets. So we'll see if that's going to fix this chip being missing or if we need to put that back in. So let me go look at the schematics and see if we can figure it out. 
So we're interested in IC25, IC22, and IC21. These are the um, blueprints that came with the, the game. All right, so here are our two ROMs, and if you look very carefully, here is IC25. Now it gets one address line, and it gets a line from this decoder here, all right? And it's just used for addressing. And then it feeds into itself, and it has one output on pin one. That comes down. and ties to pin 20 of IC21 and IC22. So it's the uh, chip select 2 line. So basically, if you're not using these chips, you don't need that IC25. So I'm going to leave it off. That's my theory, at least, that I think I'm correct. So that's what we're going to do. Now, we have to change it, though, because we have to get this one to work. This is our socket that didn't have anything in there. Now you might be wondering, well why are you even doing that? It's because these two chips are little tiny EEPROMs and they're right in the way of the battery damage too. So you can get rid of both of these and replace it with just this one. So that's what we're trying to do. We're going to put a 2716 um, EEPROM in there. It's just an old school hack people used to do. Essentially what you're doing is this is a System 3 board, you're turning it into a System 4 board, um, which was the next one around, and that's what they did in System 4. They got rid of these and added that. Okay, So um, let me show you how to do that. It's real simple. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do, this is the chip select. That's that 7442 that we were just looking at, IC15. And if you look, they don't use this, but they're using the chip select pin is tied to pin 9 of IC15. Okay? So pin 9 is right here and it's actually connected to this little this little round solder pad there. So I have cut that trace just to the left of it violently. So that solder pad is no longer connected to pin 9, okay? So we, that is not doing this thing anymore. Now that solder pin, I mean that solder pad, runs down and connects to pin 20 of this. You can actually see it on the back if you want to look. I believe that's it right all there. And if you look, it runs down and wham! It goes to our new socket that we added in. Okay. So we have disconnected it. So now it's not going to get selected. So what we're going to do is we're going to tie this little solder pad, which is now connected to pin 20, is no longer connected to pin 9. We're going to connect it to pin 1. So again, we're taking it off 9, which is how it's connected now, and we're going to connect it to pin 1, which this board is already using pin 1. Remember, it was using it to go through this 7402, to select these two ROMs. So we're replacing these two with that one. And we're just gonna, we're not gonna use the 7402, we're gonna use pin one. Now, uh, normally the way you do it is you just leave all this hooked up, but we actually have that chip missing because we took it out whenever we were cleaning everything up. So we're gonna take pin one and uh, jumper it to that solder pad, which is gonna activate that. And that's gonna make it more like the way the system four boards were designed and then we can burn one EEPROM here instead of two here. All right, I'm chopsticking it, but basically pin 20 is connected to pin one. All right, so we got it, uh, we got it doing its thing. So I just ran a little jumper wire from there, which is no longer connected to here. It's cut down to pin one instead. Easy peasy. Okay, so I think we've got the board done with the exception of whatever we're going to do for the batteries. Um, but we need to burn some ROMs. Now, the way these worked back in the day was they had what they called flipper ROMs. So all the System 3 games used white flipper ROMs that went here. They had a label on them that was white. 
And then later they used yellow flipper ROMs and green flipper ROMs, depending on which system it was. I think yellow was system four and green was system six or something like that. Um, but the flipper ROMs, what they did was they're basically the BIOS of the system. So they're what, they're what told the thing, uh, this is a pinball machine, this is how to run the TET, the, the, the boot up sequence, this is blah, 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 blah. It's like all of the stuff that was standardized on all of the machines were in those two ROMs. And then the two ROMs that were over here originally uh, were the game specific ROMs. So it would tell it how many lights are in the game, what this switch does, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, but if you think about it, on a pinball machine, like the, the one before this was Hot Tip and then this one's Lucky Seven, a lot of the stuff is going to be exactly the same. When the ball goes in the out hole, the same thing's going to happen. Uh, at the beginning of the game, the same thing's going to happen. Uh, it's going to turn on uh, the, the same, uh, it may play the exact same chime whenever the game starts. Uh, it, uh, the, the kickers work the same, all of that stuff. 90% of the table is going to be exactly the same. So you could have most of that information in the what they called the flipper ROMs. Okay? Uh, and then uh, the, the game-specific instructions that were over here, we have now combined into one file here. Um, one of the reasons we're doing that, too, is because these were 2708 size. I don't even know what size that is. Size EPROMs or ROMs. That's archaic. I mean, it's really, 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 really old. Um, and nobody really uses those in anything anymore. Okay, so we're going to replace it with one twice as big, a 2716. Even that is archaic, but some of the very early arcade games and the pinball machines use that chip, so we can actually still burn that. And that's about as old of an EEPROM that you can burn easily. You know, you can you can do 2708s, but just even finding 2708s that you can erase and stuff like that is very hard to do. Um, and the size of these, I believe, was 2716s as well. Uh, they actually called them 2316s, right? So that's our two flipper ROMs there. And they called these 3624s. I have no clue what that even is. But originally they were, they were PROMs. They weren't erasable, you know. 2316s for the flipper ROMs, and we're going to put a 2716 in there. But uh, these will also be 2716s. Okay, so uh, years ago, Williams, in their, one of the coolest things they ever did, they released all of the software. They had a website up where you could just download all of the software if you were doing repairs. So I've got a copy of all of that stuff. All right, so where the first flipper ROM goes, which is IC17, I have installed my Leon's Williams test ROM. Now it says system six, but it's system three, four, five, six. Um, there was this gentleman, Leon, way back in the day who made a little test chip for this. Now all of this information and a copy of this test of this chip you can find on pinrepair.com. Clay uh, basically put together all of this information 25 years ago. So everything we ever learned on pinball machines, we learned from pinrepair.com. So you can get a copy of this and burn it yourself. But basically this chip, you put it in, and it allows the board to boot without the driver board. Okay? And you can even just boot it on the board, on the desk here. I could hook up a uh, power supply to here. And um, basically when it boots, it's going to do some memory tests and stuff, and it's going to turn on a bunch of stuff, right? And uh, that's what we want. Now there's a couple LEDs up here. I believe that it can use to uh, show us some stuff. Uh, but basically, we're going to use this chip to run just a very basic test program to tell us if this board appears to be working. Once we get this working, if there's any problems with it, uh, we'll burn new ROMs for it, and then we will uh, mate the driver board to it. Or well, I guess we'll do that before we burn the ROMs and use Leon's test ROM to test the outputs of the driver board. So to test all of the solenoids, to test all of the lamps, and to test all of the switches. So that's what we're, uh, that's what we're attempting to do here. There's one last little modification we're going to do too. I know all this is kind of confusing, but this is the stuff you run into. On the System 3 board, there was a update that they did. Williams decided to get rid of this capacitor 
this resistor, this resistor, and then put a 10K resistor from this point to this point. Now, why did they do that? It's just the reset section of the game. They just decided to change it. So that's what we're going to do. I'll show you on the schematics. Basically, we're going to get rid of C27, R30, and R40. We're going to add a 10K resistor from the left side of R30 to the top of ZR1. Simple as that. And that changes the way the reset works in the game, and that's what Williams decided to do. So that was like a an upgrade bulletin that they put out a long time ago. So we're going to do that real quick, hopefully get the reset working a little better. All right, folks, today's video is sponsored by E-Win. Now, you may think, why are you doing a sponsored video? It's because of my brother Joey here. Joe, tell him about how your back hurts, your knee hurts, your leg hurts. I've got problems. He's got problems. Joey's lost. Somebody in a video previously was saying you lost some weight, Joey. Yeah. Well, my back's been hurting. I think I pinched my sciatic nerve somehow. But anyway, we had a we had a chair that he sat in here at the shop, and he felt fine if we had that chair. And then we had a customer come in and break the thing sitting in yeah. it, so the chair fell apart. So we need a new chair, and this company Ewin got a hold of us and said, "Hey, would you like to try our chair?" And we said, "Why, we sure would." Yep, the timing, the timing worked. The out timing was perfect, and this thing is more heavy duty than the one we had. So we're going to take it out of the box and see if it's any good. This is the one that we got. Look at this. It, the first thing we notice is it's a lot heavier than the other chairs that we've had. We've been getting, you know, decent size, decent office chairs. This one's heavy, which is good. Joey really likes the bottom. Sweet. The back's so heavy I can't even hardly pick it up. It comes with a nice little instruction thing. Joey so far is totally impressed, but we haven't sat in it it's yet. It's even got metal screws. It's like you're bolts. building a 1959 Cadillac. Lots of metal. This looks like quality so Steel far. Steel and stuff. It's kind of cool they use like hog rings like you use on car upholstery. Um, and it's just heavy duty. There's some strapping down here too. Pretty nicely made. It seems to me it's kind of like it's a it's a decent uh, car seat, uh, like that style of of um, of uh, construction, but for a gaming chair. Yeah, we about got it finished here. Looking pretty good, Jet. What? It... I think I'll save these for later. Huh? You were supposed to wear those while you put yeah, them on. That's fine. Ah, while you put it together. All right, show them the the uh, the uh, the drop. Whoop. <laughs> so the hydraulic thing works pretty good. Okay, abuse it a little bit. That's pretty good. All right, do the lean back. All right. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, world about fell out from under me. Did it scur you? Yep. Seems to be pretty nice. We like it. Very cool. All right, so we don't know long term how well it'll work, but let me show you the ones that we were using before. This is what I can't believe. They actually gave us extra hardware. There's one extra of each size screw and an extra cap, and it comes with the two Allen wrenches you need. Pretty impressive. Here's the chair that we were using. Now this is what you call, what do they call this, Joe? It's a tanker chair. Tanker chair. They used them on like battleships. Yeah. Navy had them back in the day. But it's old, folks, and there's no cushion. Then we've got this one. This is just your typical office chair. It's okay, but again, not much cushion. The back can't be adjusted. Um, and then we got this one. It's pretty impressive so far. What do you give it, Joe, so far? I give it a 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10. That's pretty good. And I don't give nothing a 10. He don't give nothing a 10. So it was impossible to be a 10. So you might want to check them out. E-win. Or, I mean, seems nice. I've had trucks with worse seats than this. He keeps going on and on and on about it. I can't get him to shut up. Okay, folks, so I've plugged in the five volt output of the power supply, and I've plugged in just the volt, the uh, power input of the CPU board. So everything else is unplugged. The reason that you wanna do that if you're using this test ROM is it's going to pulse all of the peripheral interface adapter stuff, which means, uh, 
let's say one of them is running the uh, the coils. Well, it's going to go bang, 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 and turn on every coil constantly. On and off, on and off. We don't want that. That would be very bad. But we do want that so we can test it. We just don't want it to actually turn on all the coils. So, again, you can do it on the bench, but I never really do anything on the bench. I like putting it back in the machine just because I've already got the power supply and everything here. All i got to do is plug it in. I'm tall, too, so it's easy for me to reach way over there. Don't worry about it. Okay, so... Uh, the gentleman I was talking about, Mr. Leon, his last name was, I think, Bore, B-O-R-R-E. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, he was in Europe. I'm not sure which country. I wouldn't try to guess. But back in the day, he uh, was just a really cool pinball repair guy, and he came up with that code, uh, that, that little uh, uh, ROM to test these. He did a whole bunch of other ones for all kinds of other uh, pinball things. He's really one of the really cool pinball repair guys that was around. So he, it basically, if you had uh, like an older, kind of more obscure pinball system, that dude would jump right in and try to figure out how they worked and everything. So he's very well regarded. Now, he passed away many, many years ago. So I'm going to show you his picture, though, since we're using his test ROM. And you can see this guy. You'll get the whole story just by looking at this cool picture of him. So that's Mr. Leon. Uh, he came up with this test ROM. So he's been gone about 13 or about 11 years now. Um, so we'll see uh, if his test ROM is still helping us fix things. I'll bet it is. Uh, again, you can get his stuff on pinrepair.com is where I always got all of it. So basically, we're going to turn it on. And what should happen is basically these LEDs here should start blinking. And if they start blinking, basically the board is able to run code. And then there is a memory test that we can do that he's got built into the software that's going to check our 5101, our 6810, and our other 6810. So let's see if uh, Mr. Leon will give us a help from the other side here. We're looking for the LEDs to do something. Yep, perfect. Uh-oh. What was that? That's what they're supposed to do. It's supposed to just blink nonstop like that, but it did a little freaky thing there. Let's try it again. Blink, 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 blink. All right, so we're blinking over and over again. That's how it's supposed to be. When it did that little thing a minute ago where it kind of did some, some stuttering weird stuff, if I was going to guess, I would say that's probably the CPU socket. I haven't replaced that. Let's see if I mess with it if it, nothing's happening. Okay, um, and so this to do the memory test on his, uh, on his ROM, you hit this bottom button, and it's going to test those three. So what it'll do is it'll go off, It'll blink one of the lights and then the other light, and then it'll go back to this if everything's good. If the top light stays on or the bottom light or they both stay on, that has something to do with telling you which one of these is bad. So let's see what we get. And we're back to normal. Let's try it again. They're on. Top one, bottom one, and then both of them. Okay, so it's saying that all of our RAM are good. That could be what it was doing a second ago whenever it did that. Maybe that button was a little finicky. Let's try turning it off and back on one more time. Okay, everything seems to be cool. So it's basically the CPU, the reset's working, the clock must be working, the CPU is working, and it's talking with the uh, the code. It's reading uh, Leon's code. It's blinking the the PIAs like it's supposed to. Um, and it's whenever we press the RAM test, it's telling us that the RAM are good. 
Very cool. So I'm gonna hook up a tester so that we can test the output of this PIA up here, the 6821, and just see if any of them seem to be hung or anything like that, or if it's able to output all of its, uh, all of the outputs on the PIA or not. And that'll kind of be the last thing we have to check on it, and then we can start working on the driver board. So it's still up and blinking away. I've hooked up a logic probe to the board. So we're gonna test pins two through 17. 19 and 39 so that's all the outputs of the PIA right so basically the ROM the software is telling it to to blink I don't have that screwed in so You can see how this would be very helpful on a on a uh, test bench, you know. So I'll, I'll uh, check through the rest of them. I need to put a screw in that thing so that I don't have to keep trying to fight it in the air. But um, basically, this is telling us the CPU is working, the resets working, the power is working, the clock signal is working, and it's actually able to control the PIAs. Very cool. All right, folks, so I checked them all, and uh, every one of them is toggling, doing its thing, so I believe that CPU is working just fine. We didn't add the battery back in yet. Um, you could probably also add in a uh, NVRAM in, in the place of one of these 6810s, maybe, to replace that 5101 so you wouldn't need the battery. The battery backup, uh, unlike a Bally, a Williams will not boot without a good battery. It'll come up in audit mode each time, which is just how they made this the software. Uh, so you have to have a working battery on a Williams. You can you can work around it by just turning it off and back on really quick, but um, it won't play um, every time you turn it off. It'll come up in the test mode. So uh, we'll have to do something about that, and we need to work on the driver board. So that's what we'll do next time. So I hope you enjoyed it so far. This is kind of what we do when we work through an old board. Like I said, might be a better idea to buy a brand new board depending on your situation, but it's kind of cool to work on these old ones every once in a while and see if you can bring one back from the dead that uh, uh, maybe needs a little bit of help. So I think, we've, I think we've saved this one. It'll be cool to see the rest of it pop up though. So I've got a driver board that says won't boot. So in the next video, we'll figure out why that is and we'll just use Leon's test ROM to check it too. Once the driver board's attached, it will also pulse all of those PIAs. So you can test the whole freaking driver board using that chip. Very cool. So uh, we'll see you on the next video. Leave your comments down below. Make sure to give us a thumbs up for taking the trouble to film it for you. I hope you enjoyed some of this old school stuff that people used to do back in the day when they uh, uh, worked on the original boards instead of having to buy a new one. Uh, make sure to check out my brother Donnie. If you don't know about him, my brother has his own channel here on YouTube. Uh, there's a link down below. We do pinball machines, arcade games, jukeboxes. My brother Donnie does old buildings, old vehicles, things like that. I'm over there with him on his channel a lot. A fun time is had by all. But join us here next time. We'll work on the driver board. And then we still have to, of course, burn the ROMs too to uh, make the, the game actually boot up. And we haven't done anything with the displays. We've still got everything disconnected. So hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. I know I had a good time. Thank you, Leon.